Okay, good evening. Um, I'm pleased to welcome you to this joint event between Friends of Imperial College and the Society for Computers and Law. My name is Bill Blackburn and I'm Deputy Chair of Friends and I also sit on the SCL Advisory Board. Back in 2017, Friends of Imperial visited the Next Generation Neural Interfaces Lab at the college campus in South Kensington, and we saw the leading edge research being done by the multidisciplinary team. Our discussions with the research team touched on the potential impacts of this technology on society, but it wasn't something we explored at the time. In 2019, the Royal Society Review and Report titled iHuman raised the profile of the topic with media coverage, including an SCL editorial. The review set out a number of recommendations, particularly around the need for wider engagement and for the public to be given a voice in shaping the future of regulation. We were therefore keen to move the debate forward. We started planning this event in February and I'm absolutely delighted it's now happening. Uh, by running this as a joint event, we've been able to tap into the science and engineering at Imperial College and also the technology law capabilities across SCL members. Pleased to say we have about 250 people registered for this evening's event and special mention to school students who are regular participants in Friends events. Uh, we have Guildford High School, Francis Holland School, Carl Shalton Boys Sports College and Sir John Law School. And we also have people from universities and colleges from the UK Austria, Germany, the Netherlands and France. I'd like to say a very special thank you to the experts that we have with us this evening, both for their time in preparing for this event and participating this evening in talks and panel discussions. I'd also like to thank Trish Shaw and Caroline Gould from the SCL and Jack Pilkington from the Royal Society, who have worked together with myself as the organizing team. With that, I'll hand over to Trish Shaw to say a few words. Well, good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for participating in this first joint event, uh, as we've rightly pointed out already. Um, we're really looking forward to hearing from our prestigious uh, panelists and uh, speakers tonight. Uh, just to give you um, a level of expectation for this evening, this event is being recorded and will be available certainly on the SCL website. And if we can, through the Friends of Imperial College, we'll make some link available through that as well after this event. So everything that you'll see now is being recorded. So tonight's event will be in two parts. The first part will be part A, where we'll be looking at the, the real science, the research and the bioethics. This will take us into a, um, about an hour's worth of discussion. Uh, including 15 minutes of Q&A with that. We'll then give you a second part of this evening where we'll be having a panel of discuss um, people discussing the topic of establishing regulation, ethics and legal frameworks. So that again will be about 45, 50 minutes. And then we'll hear uh, finally, but last but not least, from Jack Pilkington at the end of this evening. So our first set of um, speakers this evening will be um, Dr. Tim Constantinou, and he is um, leading the Next Generation Neural Interfaces Lab at Imperial College. And our se second speaker, whom Tim will pass to, um, is uh, Dr. Uh, Ranan Gil Gillon, um, who will be speaking to you um, from a bioethics perspective. So, and I would like to also introduce that tonight, Lord Tim Clements-Jones has kindly offered to chair this event as well with us. So um, first and foremost, I'd like to pass you over for our first um, speaker tonight, Dr. Tim Constantino. Thank you. Good evening, all. Um, I would thank. I would first like to thank both the Friends of Imperial and the SCL for inviting me, and uh, specifically for selecting this topic. Uh, I'm Tim Consandinu from the Electronic Engineering Department at Imperial. My research focuses on developing technology for interfacing uh, to the nervous system, mainly for medical applications and mainly implantable devices. I want to start just examining the title iHuman. This, this, this came from the perspective published by the Royal Society. And this was very much inspired by the iPhone and originally the iMac. And I, in that case, uh, referred to the internet. Um, so iHuman refers to the human to connected to technology. So over the next 20, 25 minutes, I want to assess where we are today with neural interfaces 
what are the challenges and what's coming. So let's start off with some science fiction. It's all around us. Uh, it's an inspiration, but it also warns us of where we may be headed. So some recent examples include in the matrix, direct connection to uploading into the brain, uh, the ability to learn martial arts in Avatar, the use of a brain scanner, scanner for mind control, and uh, in Black Mirror, uh, some examples of when some of these technologies may go a little bit too far. So the question is, is this fact or fiction? So the media also likes to pick and choose quotes at, to put a sci-fi on this topic. And we can see headlines such as downloading memories, uh, addiction implants, the merging of human and machine, the AI doctor, and the notion of hacking the brain. And so for anyone not directly related to this field, they might kind of not know exactly what it is fact and fiction. So I want to start by going through what can this achieve actually today? So first of all, I want to define what a neural interface is. So I would define this as the direct connection of technical components to the brain or to the nervous system. Um, and this can be used to either restore a lost function, for example, a cochlear implant can restore hearing, or even to enhance our functioning. So for medical applications, this will inevitably and has already impacted the quality of life of millions of people. But speaking more broadly, this may even interact the way that we interact with the world or with each other. For example, imagine being able to control any electronic device just by thinking about it. So next, we're going to ask, what do neural interfaces look like? So when they're placed outside the body, they typically take a uh, wearable form factor. Depending on which part of the nervous system they're interfacing to, they might take uh, a different. So on the top here, we can see that um, the devices are interfacing with the brain. And so the, the, the device looks like a headset. If it's interest, it, interfacing with nerves within our wrist, it might take the form of a, uh, a bracelet. Or if it's interfacing to the spinal cord, it might be just electrodes placed on the skin. An implantable device um, or a device placed inside the body has three common components. It has a package, which houses obviously the electronics and the battery, a lead, and then the neural interface itself, which is typically electrodes that are uh, implanted next to the, the tissue of interest. The examples here shown on the top left is a device for epilepsy on the bottom, a device um, for uh, pain relief in, in, with, through spinal cord stimulation, and on the bottom right is um, a cochlear implant. So this graphic is taken from the iHuman report showing um, several of the technologies out there. And on the left-hand side are the uh, wearable technologies or the non-invasive technologies, and on the right are the implantable or the, the, the invasive technologies. Um, these are further characterized in, in, two, in two categories. So recording technologies read information from the nervous system and stimulation technologies write information to the nervous system. So um, starting off on the left-hand side with the wearable technologies, these can either take the form factor of a headset or a scanner or be um, electrodes that are connected onto the surface of, of the skin. If we look at the stimulation, the sorry, the uh, implantable technologies on the right, um, these are typically mostly based on electrode technologies that take different form factors um, and are targeting different points in the body, depending on the application. The one exception is what's listed here as optogenetics, um, which is a method of being able to activate neurons using light. And I will give an example of research in this field later on. So um, if we look at the different characteristics between wearable and implantable technologies, we can see the, the, the benefits and challenges of each. So I just want to highlight a few of the key drivers for most applications here. So firstly, the, the level of risk must be always assessed with an implantable. 
So does the potential gain, uh, for example, in, in quality of life um, outweigh the potential risk? On the other hand, uh, if we look at uh, repeatability, signal quality and compliance in wearables, um, th these, these are generally um, less, less uh, advantageous. And so that means that for many medical applications, wearables just aren't viable options. Whereas the opposite can be said for consumer applications that the, any potential risk with implantables does, doesn't justify uh, it from a risk perspective. So next to list a few uh, medical applications. So for diagnostics, we have things like EEG, which are electrodes placed on the scalp, ECOG, which are electrodes placed on the surface of the, of the brain through a minimally invasive procedure, or functional MRI. And these are used for assessing uh, brain function in conditions such as epilepsy, different sleep disorders, and uh, if there's been any brain injury. Next, we have wearable assistive devices. So these are de devices, um, for example, TENS machines, which are used in pain relief, for example, in childbirth, um, or uh, rehabilitation devices um, addressing kind of re rehabilitation of stroke, for example. Finally, we've got the implantable assistive devices, which has three categories. So on the left, we've got sensory prosthesis that provide us uh, a, a sensory input, such as um, retinal implants for eyesight, cochlear implants for hearing. Uh, DBS therapies in the middle, uh, which target conditions of the central nervous system, such as Parkinson's, uh, essential tremor, dystonia, um, even OCD. And finally, finally, on the right-hand side, um, we've got what, what are known as motor prosthesis that um, sense neural activity within the brain or the nervous system and use it to control something. So looking at a few success stories, um, first, I would like to start with arguably the most successful uh, implantable neural interface, which is the cochlear implant. Um, this uses an external microphone to, uh, to interface um, to, to, to the auditory nerve um, so that somebody that has profound hearing loss can, can hear. Um, there's currently somewhere between half a million and one million in use today. Next, we have the, um, the, the example of deep brain stimulation devices. Um, generally, these are used to address uh, movement disorders including symptoms of conditions such as Parkinson's, central tremor. And these have um, recently been also extended to epilepsy. There's a couple of hundred thousand such devices in use today. And I just want to show a short video that demonstrates the impact um, that, this, that these devices can have. The probe that is placed into the brain, I understand, comes level with the top of the nose and the ear and it is connected to a battery in my chest and in, in my uh, underneath the skin in my chest here and this is controlled I can control the amount of the voltage going in I can control the length of time that the pulse is and I can identify the number of times per second that it goes in and I'll turn myself off now So one of the problems is not only as you can appreciate is that you can't do very much for yourself. The whole personal hygiene has to be done by somebody else. But because my concentration now is up to 90% of my tremor and trying to control it, and I'm thinking the word Parkinson's all the time. I'm not terribly, uh, I'm not concentrating on my conversation with you at all.
you can see there's quite it's amazing so um the third um example i want to i want to give is that of spinal cord stimulation um, for chronic pain and there's a few hundred uh, thousand such devices in use today and so if we generalize to see what's inside a typical uh, neural interface if there is such a thing as a typical neural interface um, for example in a cochlear or retinal implant we'll have some sensor um, the sensory data will be uh, sent to a processor. The processor will then drive a stimulation circuit um, that will uh, provide the stimulation to, to the neural tissue. We call uh, this kind of neural prosthesis uh, a sensory neural prosthesis. Um, we then have typically the clinician or healthcare professional would calibrate the, the, and program the device over the period of weeks or months. And, and that's how the vast majority of devices work today. We then have also the category of devices that um, sense activity within the brain, decode it, and then use it to control something. And these are, are generally called motor neural interfaces, um, or more commonly, these are, replied, these are um, referred to as brain computer interfaces or brain machine interfaces. So these are defined as neural interfaces that sense neural activity, decode something useful, and use this for either communication or control purposes. And even though the two terms brain-computer, brain-machine interface are used interchangeably, generally the brain-machine interface term is used for implantable devices and the brain-computer interface term refers to wearable devices. So we can see two examples here. On the left is a trial um, of the BrainGate program. So this is an invasive brain machine interface that uses an electrode um, array that's implanted in the motor cortex part of the brain and has external electronics to interpret intention for controlling a keyboard. You can see here the connector that uh, connects the electrode array, which is um, unfortunately external um, and on the right, we have a brain computer interface that uses EEG, that's this cap placed on, on the head of, on the scalp of this person. And that's used to control um, a wheelchair um, through, through uh, intention. And so getting on to where are the challenges here? So um, what, what I would call the grand challenges firstly is information transfer rate. So what is the, the useful and robust uh, information that we can get out? So that's high level information, not just raw data. So for communication, for example, we typically type around 40 to 50 words per minute, and we speak at around 100 to 150 words per minute. And so this brain gate device can achieve at best about five to 10 words per minute, which is actually considered really, really good. Um, a non-invasive device such as an EEG headset would achieve much less, perhaps just a few characters per minute. The second challenge, uh, which I've, I've listed as kind of re reliability, has to do about making these devices continuing to work reliably over a long period of time and usability and not requiring constant retraining. Um, these technologies, we don't need a couple of hours to get them going every morning. Um, they just need to work kind of out of the box continuously. And so I'm going to look at some of the challenges in a little more detail here. So first is the trade-off between spatial resolution and the level of invasiveness. Generally, the more invasive a device is, the better it is its resolution. And high resolution is desirable, but then non-invasive devices are also desirable. The second trade-off has to do between the size of the device and its scalability in terms of the number of electrode contacts or the number of channels that we actually interface. There's a, there's a hope here that the, the more channels uh, a device has, it will actually translate to more effective devices. And the third challenge is really a challenge of electronics in general. How do we uh, ensure signal integrity while making our electronics and our whole system uh, low power? 
And so far I've been talking about challenges. So I want to also talk about some opportunities. Um, so the first opportunity is to look at, um, at application spaces outside the traditional medical space. So examples here include um, sleep monitoring, meditation, gaming, sensing our emotions, or even enhancement. And so next I'm going to give a few examples, uh, go into a little bit more detail as to where um, what's emerging and what's recently coming out there. So um, the, the latest thing in wearable devices is looking at new ways of reading out data because um, as, as you imagine these headsets, they've been around for, for decades now. Um, and so companies and research labs are looking for new ways of getting more effective interfaces. So one example is that of Control Labs that was recently acquired by Facebook. This uses um, electromyography, which is the sensing of muscle signals. And so um, by placing electrodes on the surface of the skin, it's possible to, to sense um, uh, these muscle signals. And these muscles are, in this case, muscles are used as a biological amplifier to boost the neural signal, which is very weak. Control Labs have developed this bracelet um, that aims to create an augmented reality. For example, they showed the example of typing a keyboard without there being a keyboard there. And just by sensing uh, the neural activity in the wrist, um, you can uh, estimate uh, what the person is trying to, to um, type. The second ex example is that of kernel that uses an optical technique that's known as time domain near infrared spectroscopy. So the idea here is to shine light uh, towards the brain through the skull uh, and detecting the reflected light. Uh, and by looking at changes in, in, in the received light, we can estimate uh, or, or we can measure how, how much oxygen is that in that point in the blood. And that can give us um, a good estimate of the underlying uh, neural activity. So it works in a very similar way to functional MRI. And the hope here is that it can provide a better interface than EEG for non-invasive brain computer interfaces. So next, we're going to look at some emerging implantable device technologies. So one uh, area is to combine stimulation with recording in order to close the loop. Um, so we can, we can use this to more precisely dose therapy and also to reduce side effects. And so the examples are of such technologies are to do with chronic pain or epilepsy where we're sensing a seizure and we're suppressing. The second relatively new direction is called bioelectronic medicine. And the idea here is to extend neural interfaces beyond the brain and beyond the central nervous system. So to look at all the nerves actually inside our body. There's an opportunity here to address a very, very wide um, uh, a wide range of uh, conditions and, and diseases that aren't um, tr traditionally associated uh, with the brain. So examples are inflammation, things like Crohn's disease, rheumatoidal arthritis, even diabetes. Um, a third uh, currently very hot emerging area is that of brain machine interfaces. Um, and so efforts here are really looking at how do we um, how do we achieve high resolution, high bandwidth devices? So high bandwidth in terms of high information transfer rates. And so industry here have some quite ambitious visions. One example is that of near therapeutics. Um, that's looking at developing technology for memory restoration, specifically targeting neurodegeneration and injury at the first instance. The second example I want to talk about is that of Neuralink. That's Elon Musk's company. Um, this has um, reported a device that uses these thread-like electrodes that are then uh, implanted using a sewing machine inspired robot. Um, and the, the very ambitious vision here is to merge human and artificial intelligence. So this brings me to just give you a snapshot of, of a really rapidly growing industry. So the, there are companies emerging for invasive devices, 
non-invasive devices, and even neural inspired devices. A number of these companies are new, some are established players. And this is just a snapshot of many, many companies out there today. So to, in the final part of this talk, I want to briefly mention where research is going and give a couple of specific examples that my lab's working on. So one area is ongoing research is actually looking at new, new ideas in science. So brain machine interfaces predominantly all use the idea of cursor control. So by sensing activity in the motor cortex portion of my brain, I'm thinking about moving my hand or moving my arm, and then that's moving a cursor on a screen that's controlling something. Fundamentally, if I have 100 electrodes or 100,000 electrodes, um, the speed of the link is limited about by how quickly I can think I want to move the cursor. So new ideas here are looking at interfacing with the motor cortex portion of my brain that, that connects to my vocal cords. So then maybe I can communicate by thinking that I'm speaking. But secondly, there's a growing community in this area of bioelectronic medicine. And the idea here is um, to use what's known as vagus nerve stimulation, which is the nerve that connects um, our brain with all our main organs to, um, to modulate the inflammatory response. And by doing that, we can address, as I mentioned, a, a lot of conditions that aren't traditionally um, associated with, um, with, neural, um, with the nervous system. Um, secondly, there's uh, a lot of groups working at new methods for, for neural interfacing. So instead of just um, electrical, looking at other modalities. And finally, um, new, new architectures or new system concepts. So one example here is that of Synchron that's uh, looking at implanting a neural interface through a stent, so through, th through a blood vessel. And another new direction is that of distributed devices. So what's shown here is a project I'm working on where we're creating a, a wireless network of millimeter scale devices. So making the devices really, really small and we're achieving scalability in a different way to just increasing the density of devices. Um, and this brings me to the final example, which is a project that I've been working on uh, in collaboration uh, with several other partners. Uh, the project is called Can Do, and the application is for epilepsy. So this is uh, a condition that affects roughly one in a hundred. Fortunately, most, uh, so three out of four of people with epilepsy can be managed, symptoms can be managed with medication. However, there is a 25% um, portion that uh, medication is completely ineffective. And so the approach we're using here is known as optogenetics. So this uses gene therapy to make neurons uh, light sensitive. Um, and we, using this, we can tar target individual cell types in addition to improving both the spatial and the temporal resolution. And the CANDU project is very much uh, targeting focal epilepsy that's insensitive to medication, as I mentioned. And there are three key innovations. One is the use of, of this optic stimulation method. The second is this gives us the opportunity to both stimulate optically and record electrically. So we can do a new type of closed loop algorithm that works like noise cancelling headphones. And thirdly, this requires a new type of uh, implantable device. And so we've developed the implantable device to have a standard modular architecture in terms of having a, a chest implant, uh, a brain implant and a lead so that it can work within a surgical workflow. However, the electronic architecture is a little bit different because we actually have um, active electronics in the brain implant, whereas most devices today just have a lead connected to electrodes. And so the idea is, we have the neural interface close to the brain that enables the reading and the writing, and then all the processing is happening in the chest implant. And the lead is like a digital communication bus. And so one of the key aspects that my group has been working on is designing the chip that goes inside the brain implant. So I won't bore you with all the details, but I'll just show you um, the evolution of the design um, and so what we're designing here is what's known as an optrode, 
which is, um, if you like, an optical electrode, which is implanted um, in the brain. It has a few sites in which we put light sources that can illuminate different depths in the brain. And there are electrode sites that record electrical activity at certain points. And this has gone through several iterations. But a key challenge here has been dealing with the many interdependencies across the different teams. So for example, to start off with, it wasn't clear how long the electrodes had to be or how many light emitters had to be on each one. And so um, the idea behind the ASIC is to have one chip to each of these um, electrode forks and then have a number of electrode forks. So you can see here a system of four by four optrodes where each optrode has several um, optical stimulation and electrical recording points. Uh, on the top right here, you can see a few examples of different prototypes um, along the development. And so, as I mentioned, this has been a hugely interdisciplinary project, uh, a partnership between Newcastle, UCL Imperial, um, and the NHS Trust at Newcastle. Um, and this has been organized as three work packages. So firstly, the engineering team, which, which I'm part of, which develops the device itself. Secondly, the neuroscience team that's been involved in developing the gene therapy and all the experimental work and developing uh, that important algorithm. And thirdly, the medical team that, that's really been uh, engaging with the patients, the trust, uh, developing the surgical procedure and coordinating all the documentation re required uh, for regulatory approvals, um, the legal aspect. And so this brings me to the ecosystem. So what I've learned from the CANDU project is that, is that for neural interfaces to make it all the way, at least for medical applications, it's essential to address all aspects of this ecosystem. So often in academia, we just sense, we, we just focus on the science or the technology and we neglect so, several of these other aspects. In healthcare in particular, the economics and workflow are really, really important. And all this additionally needs to work in both a regulatory and an ethical framework. And so that brings me to the final slide. So I hope you can now appreciate that merging minds and machines is both fact and fiction. Although this is possible at a low level currently, we're still some way off from mind control. So I don't see that we're gonna have mind control or telepathy anytime soon. Um, as new technologies are developed, the legal and ethical frameworks needs to be proactive here. So as with all new technologies, even things like social media, there are concerns with both, both privacy and security of data. There are concerns about side effects as, as with all mes medicines, for example. But ultimately neural interfaces will impact our way of life. There will be medical and non-medical devices, implantable devices and wearables. And uh, from a technical perspective, the key challenge is how to improve the effectiveness of the link between the mind and the machine. How do we make it faster, more reliable, more usable? And finally, remember that in order to have real impact, it's essential to consider the complete ecosystem. Um, and so that concludes my portion of the talk. And I would like to uh, pass over to uh, Professor Ronan uh, Gillen. Well, thanks very much indeed. Um, quite a wonderful set of prospects from uh, these uh, implants and indeed for the um, general uh, interfaces between uh, machines and computers and the brain, not just the ones that are implantable. Um, and I've been asked to talk a bit about uh, ethical issues. Um, and of course, uh, we already saw some of them in the, the early slides, but um, uh, as well as these fantastic beneficial um, potential uh, benefits from these activities, and we can see some of them already being hugely beneficial, there isn't a shortage of uh, ethical problems. Among them are the risks of harms uh, to the research subjects and then to the ordinary users of the various brain computer interfaces we just heard about. The potential invasion of privacy as big brother state or big brothers biotech and computech or just big tech access more and more information about us and our brain processes. 
cognitive, emotional, attitudinal, and behavioral. And then the potential problems of exacerbating existing social inequalities as the rich and powerful get not only preferential treatment for their ills, but also preferential enhancement of their ordinary healthy capabilities with memory and intelligence and general skills in enhancement. Fine for them, but leaving those who can't afford these uh, interventions further and further behind with the prospect of ever increasing social inequalities. There's even the risk that uh, mere humanity is under threat as AI, artificial intelligence, is allowed to do its own thing within an inscrutable black box whose workings uh, are permitted to be unexplainable to mere mortals. And if we, or perhaps they, build those black boxes into the human brain, dot, dot, dot. So in this talk, I want to outline an approach to thinking about these and other ethical issues based on four prima facie and potentially conflicting moral or ethical principles uh, they are beneficence, non-maleficence, respect for autonomy and justice. It's an approach that is fundamentally simple, based as it is on only four, though potentially conflicting, moral commitments. But because those principles can be combined, specified, balanced or harmonized for different circumstances, the approach allows us as much complexity as circumstances and perspectives and cultures require. Uh, my analogy is, think of four basic amino acids uh, of our genetic structure. They're pretty simple, and yet they can be, and indeed are, combined into the complex and wonderful creatures that we are. Now, as David Raphael, once a philosophy professor here at Imperial, explains, ethics is about right and wrong, good and bad, what ought and ought not to be done, and about social norms and values concerning these issues. It's also about being a good or virtuous person, leading a flourishing life of which one can be proud, about leading the good life. There are many overarching theories of ethics, of which three currently most mainstream can be grouped as deontological theories. These focus on duties and increasingly on rights and the corresponding duties that rights require. The moral theory of Immanuel Kant uh, with his famous categorical imperative is the exemplar of deontological moral theories. Uh, the second group is consequentialist theories of which utilitarianism in its various forms is the most important and best known is its Bentamite version of the greatest good for the greatest number. These two groups of moral theory focus on right and wrong actions. Deontology is primarily concerned with carrying out one's uh, moral duties, including one's moral duties to those who have rights on the basis of moral rules some of which may be consequentialist in nature. Consequentialist theories are entirely based on good or bad consequences or outcomes of one's actions. The third overarching group of ethical theories falls under the banner of virtue ethics. This is characterized by a focus on leading a good, virtuous and flourishing life and on having the character dispositions, the virtues, that result in a good and flourishing life and on avoiding those character dispositions, traditionally known as vices, that undermine such flourishing. Determining what those virtuous dispositions are often requires finding a mean or a balance between vices. To use Aristotle's original example, the virtue of courage is the mean between the vices of foolhardiness and cowardice. Other overarching theories of ethics include religious theories, humanist theories, political theories, feminist theories, care-focused theories, environment-focused theories, relationship-focused theories, narrative-focused theories, interpretation-focused theories. Uh, these are known as hermeneutical theory, ethics. And the related experienced-focused theories, so-called phenomenological ethics. And let me not forget particularism, which denies that there are any general moral principles in ethics. Each case is morally unique. And there are probably several other overall theories of ethics. The four principles approach that I'm about to sketch 
doesn't seek to adjudicate between this host of computing, competing overarching moral theories. On the contrary, it seeks to incorporate the ethical benefits of many of them, for example, by including within itself rules, consequences and virtues. And it seeks to be compatible with the justified universalizable conclusions claimed by any of these overarching theories. It's an approach to ethics that's familiar nationally and internationally to many healthcare professionals and is now usually called principalism, though I still call it the four principles approach. It was designed back in the 1970s by the Americans Tom Beecham and Jim Childress, the first a Jewish philosopher and the second a Protestant theologian. They wished precisely to help doctors and other healthcare workers to deal with the ethical issues they regularly faced, usually in context where neither the healthcare workers themselves nor their patients or clients shared a common overarching ethical theory whether religious, secular, political or philosophical. At the end of last year, the American Journal of Bioethics published an issue commemorating the 40th anniversary and the eighth edition of their foundational monograph, Principles of Biomedical Ethics. As well as the book itself, let me warmly recommend the introductory editorial that the, uh, the commemorative to that commemorative edition in the uh, American Journal of Bioethics by Beecham and Childress themselves. Principalism claims that these four prima facie principles, beneficence, non-maleficence, respect for autonomy and justice, provide a set of basic moral commitments, which often in combination are arguably compatible with the justified universalizable claims of all the overarching moral theories. Although principalism has been attacked for being over simple and indeed for many other deficiencies, it's rare to find explicit rejection of any one of these general prima facie moral commitments. Indeed, let me ask anyone listening to this, if you can personally accept these four prima facie moral commitments in your own life and in your occupational context. Perhaps you'd feed back to the conference organizers through the Q&A system. Uh, if you reject any one of these principles and your rationale for doing so. Similarly, please let us know if you think there are any universalizable moral principles that can't be explained by one or some combination of these four. Uh, and as Beecham and Childress say in their 40th anniversary editorial that I recommended, the approach is particularly useful in addressing new ethical issues, for example, in the context of development of new technologies, uh, such as the ones we're addressing this evening. Simply summarized, the four principles in no order of preference are beneficence, the prima facie moral obligations to benefit at least some others. It's important to note that this principle requires assessment and achievement of beneficial consequences. It is a consequentialist principle, but it doesn't itself require utilitarian obligation to maximize beneficial consequences. Sometimes, for example, such maximization may conflict with and be trumped by one of the other remaining three principles. But even if it does not so conflict, moral agents must decide how much to limit their commitment to benefit others. However, although maximization is not a necessary component of beneficence, we can morally reputably commit ourselves to a universalizable moral commitment to provide less than maximal benefit to fewer than maximal numbers of people. We may nonetheless regard people who do commit themselves to maximizing benefit to others as being morally admirable as morally virtuous, perhaps even as moral idealists, perhaps even as saints, while being clear that such maximizing commitment is not a moral obligation, not even prima facie. On the other hand, it's widely accepted that all moral agents do have some prima facie general obligation to benefit others quite independently of any personal or professional commitments. A duty of easy rescue is widely accepted as a minimal example of this obligation. Non-maleficence is the prima facie moral obligation to avoid harming others. Again, this principle is consequentialist. And again, it doesn't necessarily require utilitarian minimization of harmful consequences. Some harmful consequences may be morally acceptable, even required, for example, in the interests of achieving net benefit. 
or in preventing unacceptable interference with people's autonomy or in the interests of justice. Respect for autonomy is the prima facie moral obligation, of course, to respect people's autonomy, roughly defined as people's deliberated or thought out choices for themselves. Note that this principle requires, though it is rarely given when presented in summaries such as this one, the qualification in so far such respect is compatible with respect for the autonomy of all potentially affected. Note too, that it's people's self-rule, autonomy literally means self-rule, uh, not their rule of others that is to be respected, no matter how autonomous is their desire to rule others. Justice and fairness. The, there are many theories of justice. Beecham and Childress discuss six different accounts of justice, four of them traditional, utilitarian, libertarian, communitarian. I'm amused, incidentally, they no longer mention Marxist theories of justice in this context, uh, and egalitarian. And two newer theories of justice based one on capabilities and the other on actual well-being. My own view, we're unlikely to find wide agreement on any one of these theories. However, common to all of them is the prima facie moral obligation to treat people as equals unless there's a good reason to treat them as unequal, in which case they should be treated differently in proportion to the morally relevant inequalities. Note that this may involve treating them better or worse than others, depending on the morally relevant inequalities. This summary of justice, fairness, is in effect a restatement of Aristotle's formal theory of justice, according to which equals should be treated equally, while unequals should be treated unequally and in proportion to the morally relevant inequalities. The most obviously relevant inequalities in the context of health and social care concern people's health needs, but other morally relevant concerns can alas conflict with trying to meet people's needs. Now, principalism does carry some what you might call health warnings. First, these are very high level and general principles. Very often in practice, they need singly or more usually in combination to be made more specific for application to particular circumstances or types of circumstance, what Beecham and Childress call specification and balancing. Nor does the four principles approach incorporate a method for dealing with conflicts between the principles or their specifications, though useful for criteria for doing so are presented. Thus, good reasons are needed for preferring the chosen norm, uh, which should have a realistic prospect of achieving its objective. No morally preferable alternative should be available. The lowest level of infringement of the rejected norm should be selected and negative effects of the infringement should have been minimized and the affected parties should have been treated impartially. But even when all these criteria have been applied, there will remain many moral dilemmas in which the mysterious and undefinable capacity of moral judgment is required. Finally, the four principles approach does not incorporate a method for addressing the scope of those principles, to whom or to what do they apply and to what extent. Such questions apply to each of the principles uh, the abortion debate is a good example of a scope disagreement. We all agree we shouldn't murder each other, but we may well disagree. Indeed, we do often disagree about what we mean by each other. So why, you might ask, uh, should we use the four principles approach? Well, first, because it provides a set of four universalizable high level moral commitments to which all or perhaps almost all moral agents, whatever their overarching moral theory can commit themselves. Uh, some of you may be disagreeing with this in the Q&A, we'll see. I'd be surprised. It thus removes the necessity for people from different moral perspectives, whether religious, secular, political or philosophical, to engage in high level moral discourse, debate and disagreement about their overarching moral theories before they can even begin to discuss how to approach a particular moral problem or type of moral problem. Thus, the approach provides a basic common moral language, a basic common and cross-cultural moral analytic framework. And another benefit that can accrue from using these principles, understood as moral commitments and objectives, is the help they can provide in making coherent 
to a coherent sense of the host of more specific ethics guidelines, laws and regulations that can be found uh, almost everywhere, but for contemporary example, in relation to the current COVID-19 pandemic. To summarize hor horribly briefly, these specific requirements, when they aren't essentially restatements of those four broad ethical principles and commitments, can be seen as adjuncts towards achieving them, whether by combining them, specifying or balancing them, providing useful methodologies and procedures for achieving them, including in professional codes and guidelines and in laws and regulations, or by, by providing advice about appropriate personal attributes, virtues, uh, necessary or preferable for achieving the agreed objectives. The combination of a commitment to benefit with as little harm as possible has been a fundamental characteristic of medicine since Hippocratic times. I call it the Hippocratic commitment, but it could just as well be called the health care commitment. And it is entirely compatible, I see, with the primary moral commitment in our co-conveners technology foundation report. More recently, those other two moral concerns, respect for autonomy and justice, have been recognized as necessary additions for medical and indeed healthcare practice. One way of addressing the uneasy interrelationship between medical ethics and business ethics, uh, which will be encountered in this, uh, in this context of uh, brain uh, implants, might be to pursue best practice business ethics and encourage all businesses involved in the production and sale of the huge range of brain computer interface products to commit to that same ethical Hippocratic uh, commitment or healthcare commitment of undertaking to strive to produce for their clients a net health benefit over any associated harm. In legal terminology, a duty of care. When regulating and legislating for the huge range of brain computer interface technology, I'd recommend building into that duty of care, a commitment to respect people's autonomy and a commitment to justice, i.e. a commitment to all four of these principles. Crucial to the exercise of autonomy is to have sufficient relevant and therefore honest information. In addition, a commitment to avoid the use of techniques that undermine or override their client's autonomy is also needed. Here it appears to me that one of the dangers that should be addressed is the creation of addiction, which of course undermines autonomy. While this is a problem well recognized in the pharmacological sphere of healthcare and healthcare ethics, it seems grossly underrecognized in the context of the broader range of brain computer interfaces represented not only by computer games, but also in the broad spectrum of addictive uses of social media. All those likes may well be creating exploitable addictions. And in the area of justice, much ethics work will be necessary in the realms of distributive justice, legal justice, and rights-based justice, especially, of course, human rights-based justice. We'll no doubt be hearing much about those aspects of justice and fairness in the second half of this conference. My own advice here is to reiterate Aristotle's recommendation that whatever substantive theory of justice you choose, please make it explicit and make sure that your use of it conforms to Aristotle's starting point of treating people as equals, unless there are good moral reasons for not doing so. In which case, please make those reasons explicit and tailor your unequal treatment to the morally relevant inequalities. As you may have gathered, I'm no specialist in brain computer interface ethics, but my very recent reading of the reports of the Royal Society on iHuman, of the Cabinet Office's Regulatory Futures Review, of the Technology Foundation's report, and of the ethics and human rights commitments and associated case studies of the Trade Association of British Health Tech Industries, reveals a wide range of practical proposals for cooperative regulation. I think these four principles might be helpful in contributing to a coherent and unifying ethical underpinning for development of regulation and legislation in this arena, as it already does in the broad arena of biomedical ethics.
Bye-bye. <laughs> well, that was fantastic, if I may say so. Um, what a, a, a brilliant cross-disciplinary uh, 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 introduction by both of you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Tim and Rannan. Um, and I'm going to just put a couple of questions to you and then uh, have a look at the chat and um, see what comes up there. Because um, the first question that occurs to me, Tim, is almost the challenge that's been put out there by Rannan, which is, um, is there, uh, I mean, you've described that we're not you know, quite there yet in terms of uh, uh, the black box inside the brain, which, you know, controls the human being and so on. Um, but we can't be that far off it. So um, what is your answer to this uh, uh, question at the moment? Is human autonomy actually threatened yet by the kinds of neural uh, interfaces that we're talking about? And if so, are are the technologists, are the medics fully aware of the, the issues involved? Good question. Um, what I would say is uh, the majority of neural interfaces actually interface with very low level structures in the brain. So the structures in the brain that connect to our, to our muscles, the structures in our, in our brain that, that connect to our sensory organs. So even if you intercept those signals, you're only going to inter intercept the input and output signals. I think where, where questions of autonomy can come are in things um, like deep brain stimulation, which are untargeted therapies that are quite in deep structures in the mind that interact with a lot more kind of high level um, thought processes. And um, even though it might not be possible to kind of uh, interact with, 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 with specific thought processes, um, there have been observed side effects of kind of mood changes and things like that. Um, so I, I think kind of as the side effects of some of the deep brain stimulation therapies is the closest thing to kind of, uh, to kind of uh, hacking into kind of uh, personality and kind of behavior. But um, I, I mean, it's it's not it's not understood and it's not controlled in any way. But, uh, so, how conscious are you when you develop the, this type of technology of the framework that you're operating in, the the ethical framework, if you like? I mean, if if it's if it's a medical device, I, I, I think um, all clinical trials have to go through an ethics committee, and so you have to. You, you have to consider a lot of, I mean, a, a, a lot of different aspects of ethical issues. Um, also, there is a lot of patient involvement in the, in the design process and kind of, um, and so I think if it's a medical device, ethical considerations um, are, are certainly taken into account and, and are required. I think the questions are, if it's not a medical device, and if it's a company that's developing a device as a consumer electronic device, what is their uh, motivation for, 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 for considering an ethical framework? I think you've raised the wearable issue is a, yeah. is a very important one, isn't it? Yeah. And so, Renan, I mean, uh, do you think, actually, that there should be something akin to a Hippocratic oath for a technologist? I mean, how far... How far would you take uh, your desire to see these ethical principles uh, extended? Well, I'd like to see them extended to all of us, frankly. Uh, it seems to me, I, although they were developed by Beecham and Childress for use in the context of healthcare, the more I've been thinking about them, the more it seems to me that we could all do with them. Uh, they, they're simple at their, at their heart. They're infinitely complexifiable uh, in their application, but uh, as basic commitments and ethics should be available to every moral agent. So it should be simple at base. Uh, but at the same time, uh, it gets more and more complex uh, once um, you actually have to apply them in particular contexts. So I'd like uh, certainly all people who are committed to public, the public interest should um, adopt them. But I, I'd frank, frankly recommend them to every individual moral agent. Think about it for yourself. And if you, if you do find that they are compatible with your own perspective, wherever it comes from, whatever your overarching 
theory of ethics, methods of ethics is, uh, then try and uh, adopt them and try and uh, live up to them. Well, that's very good. But um, what about the mandatory approach in certain circumstances? Yes, I, I think that uh, one requires uh, in some circumstances to have um, specification of these principles uh, made obligatory. Uh, our laws are good examples of, of, of those. And I think one could interpret most of them, though, of course, there's big debate in uh, jurisprudence here about whether uh, law is necessarily ethical. It seems to me that uh, it obviously is or should be, and it's a bad law if it isn't. Um, that, uh, that those principles, it seems to me, should be part of uh, legislation. Uh, parliament uh, should adopt them, lawyers should adopt them, uh, people working wherever they're working, uh, it seems to me, should uh, think seriously at any rate about adopting those uh, prima facie commitments. Thank you. And because we're running short of time, I want to put a sort of final a wrap up qu a tech question to Tim, um, uh, which I think a lot of people will be very interested in. Um, how do you envision an invasive, non-invasive method which can achieve a true BCI? And I'm going to add to that a question that uh, people have asked about Elon Musk's Neuralink. Um, uh, which gets a lot of attention given who he is and his social media reach, but how close to a commercially viable product is this as opposed to great R&D and PR? And I think they're sort of related, those two questions. Um, What's the PCI, can you remind us? Brain-computer interface. Ah, PCI, sorry. <laughs> um, so I, I, I think the question is, how do you define a true BCI? I mean, is it... Is it something that interfaces with my thoughts related to my intention to speak? Is it something that interfaces with my, I mean, at which level is the interface is the, I think is the question. So if the interface is at a relatively low level, I think that is quite, it's quite feasible to today or in the, in the near future in the next five or 10 years. I think if you're trying to interface on a very high level with our thought process, I think we're still quite a way off. We, we don't understand a lot about the brain, uh, let alone uh, interfacing with, 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 with kind of our thought process. Um, get it, getting on to the question about Elon Musk, um, I guess what Neuralink have done very well is they've taken, um, I mean, they, they've They've taken a lot of ideas that have already been out there and done what companies do very well. And so they've had the focus and also the financial resource to be able to, to kind of fast track development of a device. Um, so it, it's kind of remarkable what they've done in two or three years time. Uh, I mean, it, it's something that couldn't happen in any university. Um, but um, I guess all the ideas were already out there and when you talk about a, a product, a, a device on the market, I think what they currently have is they have a technology um, that is targeting a wide range of applications, but I, I don't think there will be um, a, an augmentation implant on the market anytime soon. I think what they've developed will be targeting medical applications in the short term. So looking at, um, I mean, it's the only way an invasive device can be tested on a human is for, for, for medical uh, reasons. So I, I think the first applications are going to be medical um, and um, the, the human augmentation and merging um, artificial intelligence are, are a vision to the future. Yeah, interesting. And we have uh, Asad Ayub in the uh, chat uh, wants to know whether the implant software can be downloaded into a smartphone. That sounds a little bit previous to me, but uh, I'd be interested in your answer to that. Um, so the software in an implant, I mean, there there are very, there are significant safeguards to, to, to not enable that. So I, I think um, the devices aren't connected to the internet. So the only way that you can, you can uh, access a device is proximity to the device. So you, you obviously need um, another device on the outside that's very close to the device because they're through inductive um, 
um, through close proximity links. Um, also, I mean, all medical devices have got um, kind of encryption standards on there. So, um, and also the, the regulation from a medical perspective doesn't let you um, alter the software on the device um, whilst it's running. Um, and so I, I think the regulatory framework protects us from, from actually being able to do that. Great. And now we've got our um, panelists. We've got uh, uh, Professor David Nutt, um, who is the Edmund J. Safra Chair in uh, Neuropsychopharmacology at the Faculty of Medicine, Department of Brain Science uh, at uh, Imperial. We've got Jack Pilkington, who's the Senior Policy Advisor, Emerging Technologies and Futures at the Royal Society. We've got uh, Patricia Trish Shaw, who's an SCL trustee, um, who's the CEO of Beyond Reach Consulting. And we've got Chris DeMorney, who's a senior associate at Bird and Bird LLP. And um, I'm going to sort of pose some questions at each of them in turn, and then we're going to um, throw it open to the panel, um, a number of questions, and then we're going to have an open house on uh, uh, some questions that we're going to find in the chat. Um, and uh, we'll be curating those uh, in due course. But David, you've been listening um, to what uh, our splendid um, openers um, have had to say. Um, tell us about your own experience um, in the research and development and regulation of drugs um, used to treat neuropsychological conditions. I mean, what lessons have you learned? Are they in any way similar to some of the sort of issues that we've uh, been hearing about tonight? Well, what we, at one level, they're worse <laughs> because drugs come with a kind of anti-science bent. Uh, the, the, the moral, uh, kind of moral oversight of drugs is, uh, goes back very uh, many hundreds of, well, it goes back to really the, Kind of beginnings of Islam, and uh, so so we've been living with it for a long time. Whereas this kind of science hasn't uh, been around for long enough to kind of attract that sort of issue. So the first thing I would say is, you know, it really is important that scientists keep control of this, and that's the real, to my mind, the, the real danger is if if it slips kind of from science into into a more popular populist domain, uh, and then you may see a backlash. And, and I have to say, it is kind of weird that we're seeing an anti-vaccine backlash when vaccines were one of the great discoveries of, of modern medicine. So, so don't be complacent uh, and make sure that, you know, that, that, that the, pub, the public are educated from all the way through. And it's about, you know, and, and this is why I think the, the, this particular session is really fascinating because there is no question that the, the ethical elements of this have to be writ large and, and uh, there all the time if people start criticizing what we're doing. So you're drawing a distinction, really, between the kinds of drug development and so on that you're more familiar with, perhaps. But surely um, we aren't going to be able to keep control of this solely within the scientists, are we? I mean, this is this technology is already not within the medical sphere uh, alone. It's, it's as we uh, talk to Tim about, it's in the wearable area as well. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> sure. But the wearable is generally... Um, uh, not a problem in the sense that uh, the data are largely innocent and I don't think it's in yeah so if people really think that wearing a, a wristwatch which tells them about the depth of their sleep and, and helps them understand the nature of their dreams is useful they're they're, they're kind of deluding themselves I think so, so wearable technology as I see is more as an entertainment I mean it can be useful and I say at some point there will be feedback from measures of the heart rate that people could potentially interact with, but it's unlikely to be harmful. I think it's the it's a, it's when you get into the brain and start doing things there that that's where the, the backlash will come. You see, that's what the interesting thing is. I think Rannan, when we talk to him later, uh, might come back to addiction because surely some of the personal devices that we have, I mean, the, the big issue is about being addicted, screen time, you know, and so on and so forth. Does, isn't that the crossover point, perhaps, with your, uh, 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 you know, work previously? Yes, and in fact, well, interesting, it's been there for some time there's been an offer uh, through, I think, in the University of Amsterdam, to take people who are addicted, and they've been offered the possibility of the kind of deep brain stimulation that you saw so effective in the man with Parkinson's disease. That's actually been offered. Theoretically, you could interrupt the 
circuitry of addiction in the same way as that man had his the circuitry of for Parkinson's interrupted, but almost no take up. I mean, it, it's I, don't, I think disorders like addiction still are seen as sort of mind disorders as opposed to brain disorders, which which is wrong, of course, uh, and it's uh, uh, that's another issue we have to try to develop some more insightful education. What you've come round to doing is saying there are some parallels here. Oh no, there are. There Not are. That I want to put words in your mouth, David. No, there are parallels. Um, and I, th I think the the important thing is that we don't uh, overstate the case, so that there is a we don't encourage an overreaction. I think in th the other thing I would say is that this kind of technology is at a rather more privileged situation because it's still experimental. You haven't got the enormous costs that come with doing so-called controlled trials with with drugs, and uh, and and. Take, the, take this as a rather sort of golden period for, for this neural interface uh, technology. Really do your very best now, because at some point you may well discover that the regulations do get in the way. That is really interesting. But that, that's what worries some people. I mean, this, we may have already trans, you know, gone beyond the bounds of, of, uh, of autonomy, so to speak, in Renan's uh, language, um, which means that actually we should be uh, uh, having some framework, some ethical framework in place as of now, before you know all hell breaks loose and 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 uh, you know we're into unknown territory. Well, I do agree we should do things ethically, yes. <laughs> and I think when I, I don't believe anyone is currently doing anything inside people's craniums without ethics. I hope not. <laughs> Well, we'll come back. We'll come back and find out from Tim maybe um, later on uh, whether that may or may not be the case, uh, whether in the UK or or elsewhere. Um, so uh, I'm going to go on to Jack um, because Jack, you've um, uh, written on this subject and yeah. um, uh, you've been at the forefront really of shaping policy uh, with regards to the regulation of uh, neurotechnology. Um, um, what you know where are we now do you think we've heard um you know about the technology we've heard about the sort of ethical framework that uh, ranan is proposing we've heard um some of david's experience um uh on this and um uh, are we still very much in the foothills in all of this yeah i think i think i think we've heard a lot about kind of some of the amazing medical applications from tim and also some of the kind of ethical issues that might come up in this field going forward and I think really this is kind of, I work, so I work at science policy for Royal Society. And this is literally the most like ideal project you could look at because it's the real question is how do we make the most of these medical advances whilst also mitigating some of the risks of the, of the ethical issues that, that are going to come up. So where we're at currently is that essentially um, the MHRA, the, the medical devices regulator, we, 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 we subscribe to the, um, the European MDR, which is a, again, medical devices regulation. So the really kind of important point here is that we have Brexit coming forward, right? As we all know. Um, and it looks like the UK is kind of keen on setting out its, its, its own approach to regulating these devices. So when we were looking at this, this kind of, this, uh, this project, neural interface as a whole, we really focused on the regulation and, and we tried to set out and call for what we called an anticipatory and democratized approach. And that sounds very jargony, so I'll, I'll unpick that slightly. Essentially what we mean anticipatory, we, mean we, need, we want to try and predict and be proactive about thinking about where some kind of issues may emerge. And in relation to what David's been saying, we really want to engage the public and make sure the public has a clear voice in how these technologies are regulated. So the kind of main point I want to make really is that we have very safe regulation for this area. And um, however, the UK is looking like it may want to make its own in the future. And we really have an opportunity to bring the public in and to do it right. And really make sure that if we want to become a world leader in this area, we do so with the technology, but we also do so with the ethics. And I really hope you make the most opportunity. Yes, I, I absolutely understand that. But of course there is, um, and I've had that debate myself in recent days, about the definition of medical devices as to whether or not they fully cater for, yeah. if you like, what is happening with dynamic uh, algorithms and so on and so forth. So, I mean, there is that debate going on, but the broader debate is about the wearables and so on. Uh, David, uh, I think, is is rather relaxed about the role of wearables. Others are not quite so relaxed yeah. um, because they have ambitions, uh, medical 
uh, uh, the, the wearable manufacturers have ambitions and the data that they're collecting, um, it can be quite extensive. So, you know, are we seeing a, a, a confluence of, of regulation there? Yeah, I mean, I think yes or no in a way. So the, the European MDR, um, for a while, it didn't cover non-medical uses of things like EEG, um, of things like TDCS, which is a way of, um, kind of simulating the area of the brain. Um, it then it then was amended to update to include quite a lot of non-medical devices. Um, Tim Tim see many more than me, but I, I don't think it still comprehensively covers all non-medical uses. I think there's a bit of a grey area around some consumer products. I think what you saw from Tim's talk earlier on is that there are so many emerging consumer uses that could well stretch these regulatory frameworks a bit more. And again, the question is, if that was the European MDR, I think the, the UK's new proposed um, medical devices bill is probably going to um, take over some of the principles and probably take over a lot from the European MDR. But how do we choose to regulate these things going forward? Do we choose to come up with one kind of universal way that takes into account non-medical uses and consumer uses? That would seem to make sense to me. But yeah, we'll see. Yes. And how aligned to, if you like, um, uh, uh, the, the ethics of medical uh, trials are uh, medical devices ethics. I mean, is there is is there a need to be different, or in fact, are the principles? And of course, we heard um, uh, from Rannan about what the uh, you know, in a sense, his view of that um, set of principles was. Do you think they should be different, or or are we talking about a different kind of a slightly different universe for those? Yeah, I so I, I think I think my account and my sort of um, call for ethical considerations is perhaps a little bit different from Ronan's and what else we've discussed so far, and in, in terms of how things are trialed. I I the reason kind of we really focused on the ethics um, in our report was more about considering how these things may be used in the future. So you're not necessarily thinking about the trials of these technologies, but you're more thinking about how these things are going to impact society going forward. Um, are, are, if, you, if you start to think about consumer technologies, um, do we have issues with data privacy that in fact go beyond what we've seen previously? Because these are devices that, of course, relate to your brain and your body. So it, it, I, I think I'm more kind of interested in bringing the public in ethical concerns about its use going forward. I don't know, I don't know too much about the kind of... Um, the kind of procedures you need to go through to actually trial these products. I'm more about concerned about the societal impact, I think. Yes, that's interesting. But of course, that's often the very bit that is not uh, subject to uh, uh, ethics, you know, impact assessment and so on. Is that all part of the rubric um, uh, as we speak? I somewhat think it doesn't, does it? Yeah, I mean, it's it, look, it, it's 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 difficult, right? It's difficult to account for how things impact society. That's that that's a tough thing to do. But I, I think we have lots of examples of um, of kind of emerging technologies that that, that, that have been addressed with well and, and have brought the public in and really considered these kind of ethical debates at an early stage. And I, I think just because it's hard, it doesn't mean we shouldn't try and do it, right? <laughs> I think yeah. we've heard a lot about how early these technologies are in development, and we really have the opportunity to do this well from the outset. I like your approach because basically you're saying what you need to have is a debate to start with. I mean, the human uh, fertilizer and em uh, uh, fertilization em embryology debate was uh, something that when I chaired an AI select committee, we used that as a positive yeah. example. And you would take that as well. No, absolutely. So, I mean, my understanding of it is that it was set up um, essentially way in advance from the, the real sort of widespread use of IVF and other reproductive technologies, but it was set up with a kind of a debate right at the outset, and that, that led to an independent regulator that's been able to adapt over the course of about 30 years or so to any new developments in reproductive tech and change according to people's change in opinions. I think that's just like one example of a way that you can be a bit kind of proactive and bring the public well, it is doable. Terrific. Um, Chris, uh, just give us a little bit of a, uh, a taste of what you see the current regulatory framework as being. Um, and then we can perhaps, you know, tease out as to what may be happening internationally, you know, what you thought, what you think might develop um, uh, 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 going forward, whether it's by case law or regulation. Um, uh, so just sure. give us a little bit of a picture of the current situation. Yeah, let me do that. So um, Jack's already mentioned the MDR. So that's the medical device um, regulation. Uh, we, we, those are um, UK regulations that implement the uh, medical device directive um, from the EU. 
And those are the principal source of law at the moment for governing, getting a medical device onto the market and getting approval for it. Um, and the way it works, just in a very quick overview, is that the regulations provide a classification system um, depending on the level of perceived risk that the device will pro pro um, provide, uh, present. And um, depending on the level of classification, um, either one, two A, two B or three, there's, a, there's a, a, a more straightforward or more stringent way of getting approval um, from the, the notified body, which is sort of delegated um, um, a, a authorizing um, body. And um, that governs then the amount of information that you need to provide, the level of, um, of risk that you need to have shown that you have avoided. Um, if it's class three, you need to have done a clinical investigation, which is sort of similar to doing a clinical trial um, of a drug, although it, it, it doesn't have quite you know, the same um, structure uh, and, and whatnot. So, so that's the main thing for, if you like, getting a product to market. And the other thing that's highly relevant here, I think, is product liability. So where a device goes wrong, um, and somebody suffers some kind of injury or other damage, there's product liability that applies generally to products of all sorts, um, not just to medical devices, but it applies so to medical devices. Um, and that provides for um, a, a, a consumer, or in this case, a patient to potentially claim where they've suffered damage, um, either because the device is defective or um, if it's it not defective, but it has um, gone wrong in, in some other way, if there's a duty of care from the manufacturer. So I think that's also you know, a, a highly relevant topic here. Um, and at the moment, as Jack mentioned, you know, we, we're about to hit the end of the transition period for Brexit. Um, and it's a rather um, interesting confluence of events with medical device regulation that there, there was due to be um, an updated medical device regulation, that is EU regulation, coming into force this summer, uh, or the uh, final implementation, in, implementation date being this summer. And because of COVID, that was put off by the EU until next year. And so the medical device regulation from the EU has sort of fallen into uh, a gap, if you like, that was probably not intended and doesn't automatically come into the um, post-transition period um, regime. And that's why the government has put forward the medical device bill, I understand, and that will empower, if it's passed, that will empower the Secretary of State to amend the existing UK medical device regulations and potentially update them. And I think um, so. One of the other panelists has already sort of alluded to this, but this is almost a, a classic Brexit scenario. That, depending on your point of view, this is either a grand opportunity for the UK to develop something better, or we're putting ourselves out of sync with Europe for no good reason. And that's a that's a matter of of judgment, and also a matter of seeing what the government actually does. Well, that's interesting. But what would your judgment be? Would you go for the cautious international approach or would you say, right, let's strike out and make sure that we uh, cover the waterfront of new, new algorithms, neural interfaces, etc.? Well, I think there's, there's a lot to be said for um, being in step with other countries, provided other countries are keeping up to date. Um, and it's it happens that the EU has been looking to update medical device regulation and has just done so. And so it is relatively speaking up to date, but at the same time it, for this quite narrow topic that we're talking about today, it doesn't focus on or specifically address the kind of issues that we're discussing. And so to the extent that you know, this particular issue of neural interfaces is going to be dealt with um, in legislation, we as a country have the opportunity to do something about that 
um, and potentially to forge the way forward if that is uh, what uh, the government wants to do. But you'd prefer other people to follow along as well, presumably? Well, it's it's for for, um, for businesses who are producing these things down the line, then compliance um, is, a, is an issue. And if the, com- the rules for compliance are similar or the same in large uh, markets, then those markets are more attractive for getting the products to market. You know, if it's, it's again a classic EU sort of thing, really, that you can hit those, however many it is, 400 million or something market for a consumer product if you comply with the EU regulations. And if you're going to market in a country with a, with a smaller population with different um, requirements, it may just simply not be commercially worthwhile. Thank you. I'm just going to ask you just a quick answer on uh, registering neurotechnology patents. Frustration yes. or success? Uh, well, I, I don't actually deal with patent registrations. I, I'm not sure that I can give you an answer for a sample, but I, I mean, there's no particular reason why you shouldn't be able to do it other than keeping an eye on the exclusion for methods of, of uh, surgery and human treatment. But a, but a product per se it should be fine. So you can get through. We're going to talk to Tim about that later and just see what, what his experience has been on the ground too. Um, Trish, so, um, uh, you know, what kind of ecosystem do you see? You cover, you know, a very broad waterfront here. Um, what do you think needs to be put in place? And uh, you've heard everything today, uh, particularly in relation to these neurotechnologies. So that's really interesting because what I think we're seeing is this divergence between the kind of the regulation around the, the medical devices and the medical applications and the products that we're seeing there and then the use of AI and the integration with that of it being data driven. So we've already got a confluence of various different pieces of law and different ecosystems here. Um, I'm, I'm just going to comment there really with regard to AI because uh, and the kind of ethics of AI um, because I've been involved with the IEEE um, in creating some ethical standards for international application and I think um, where this comes to our last speaker's point is that this is trying to bring about a consistency of approach at a global level um, regarding data-driven technologies and artificially intelligent um, automated systems to try and help organizations consistently one kind of dep- uh, design them, deploy them, uh, so develop them, deploy them, ultimately monitor them and then eventually decommission them. So it's a whole AI life cycle picture here. And um, not only having that consistency of approach in one jurisdiction, but a number of jurisdictions. So to that end, you need some overarching picture and whether uh, I would like to see that as being ethical principles, particularly uniquely ethical AI principles. Um, Ran and very helpfully mentioned um, four of them uh, in the AI space. There's a fifth one which talks about um, expli- um, transparency and explicability. And um, but even then, with those five, we, we've got a confluence of a variety of different AI principles that are ethically aligned across the globe. And at the moment, it's it's teetering on around 160 different sets of ethical principles uh, to align with AI. So we've got this one problem first and foremost: that which which set of principles do you apply? Whose principles do you apply? And then once you've got that kind of the value system, if you like, the, the ethic that sits beneath the framework of this, um, and whether that's an origination kind of ethic in the process and understanding the decision making as to how you came to an outcome, the c- categorical imperative, imperative and the ontological approach, or whether it's the, the outcome and the consequentialist approach or looking at the societal and ethical impacts around us. Um, I think it is challenging. So you've got the kind of overlying principles, but underneath that you need uh, processes, procedures, policies that businesses, you know, and um, medical uh, professionals can apply on a day-to-day basis. And this is in the absence any regulation so my hope is regulation would point to these things i absolutely understand that i think you've gone through ranan's uh, uh uh ethical principles very nicely but there is this issue which is not just about what indiv- uh, what ethics an individual developer or 
uh, if you like, somebody who's applying a particular technology uh, needs to follow. There is a societal issue, and this is where, you know, one of those for justice, surely isn't that particularly difficult to legislate for, to regulate for, and so on, because if somebody, for instance, gets a, a sort of brain enhancement product um, because they can afford it, you know, it's a very expensive product. They then, as a very wealthy person, you know, what they can live to 130 years old or whatever it may be. I mean, do we have any method of uh, ensuring there's any a reasonable equality of access to these devices? Should we have any uh, regulation or legislation about access to these kinds of devices? I mean, isn't this exactly what these devices will eventually throw up? You know, it could be prosthetics, it could be brain implants, it could be a whole host of things. I think we, we live already in an unequal world. We already live in an unequal society. And whether we like it or not, or accept it or not, justice doesn't happen very often. And um, we have parts of the globe that do not have access to even the most basic of medical uh, care, let alone devices. So, and only also within our own jurisdiction of the United Kingdom, we, we, we've already seen with the COVID tracker and tracer tools, the disparity we have with digital inclusion and digital exclusion, some, sometimes through age and sometimes through socioeconomic circumstances. So until we address the system, systemic issues, we're not going to get a better outcome. Uh, if you do what you've always done, you'll get what you've always got. So really, we need to address the systemic issues, which comes to Jack's point, actually, and what the Royal Society paper said is engage early and engage often. And if we can really co-design, co-create and start to co-govern these technologies really early on with people and right through the design, we can start to help change public mindsets, also make the awareness there and the understanding there increase the education around this but then also perhaps we can start to influence policy to make accessibility and inclusion a reality so we, we saw a clip from Harvard Burma earlier on and who mentioned that you know disability is a club that anyone can join at any time and I think we, we don't do enough we see the curb cuts and the text messaging provisions that we've put in place which were originally designed for disability that are now being enjoyed by all. We've got to understand that these technologies aren't just for a small segment of society, but actually can be better a lifestyle for everybody. So this could be the sort of Formula One argument. You uh, develop the, you know, the high quality uh, uh, car, which then, you know, the te technology is spun off into other areas. And that's OK, because eventually that's what that's that it will come across to the rest of society. Is that the, is that the argument, basically? Not wholly. Um, I appreciate we don't want just the elite uh, um, taking advantage of it from the early doors and then we have some kind of um, equivalent of an arms race in neural brain interfaces. But the, I think what we will need to have is carefully crafted um, regulation, perhaps R&D budgets actually around this to, to, to show what are the purposes for which this can be used, who can actually get to use this and why, and really have a free business case from a governmental level for it. And, and finally, uh, for this point, soft law or hard law? I mean, uh, you're, you're a bit of a governance fan, aren't you, as opposed to regulation? Uh, well, quite. That's interesting you say that, Tim, because actually I think uh, I, without the impetus of regulation, people will not implement the governance, people will not implement the ethical principles with the necessary processes and procedures behind it. It costs money. So why would they do it without the regulatory impetus? So until we have the regulatory impetus, I implore organizations, institutes to put appropriate governance and stru constructs in place with, which are ethically aligned so that we have some element of safeguards, so soft law in the interim and one that applies a consistent approach across the globe. I'm with you, so it's a timing issue. Yeah, thank you. I'll come, I'll come back to you, David. We're going to throw it open, but I'm going to throw, I'm going to ask Tim, first of all, um, I mean, what is your view about the uh, regulation governance uh, aspect, uh, Tim? I mean, how much does this impinge on you? How much do you think this needs to be done with a framework? And how much in your life do you see commercial entities 
actually not observing the norms of ethics, so to speak? So um, I, I think regulation in my space um, is there to, to ensure two things, I mean, mainly safety, um, secondly, efficacy. Um, and I mean, I mean, I mean it's, there, it's there for a good reason. Um, the problem is it's very much evolved out of the, the, the pharmaceutical space. And so every new medical device that's being developed or that's been submitted to the reg regulatory process is an exploration uh, because there, there is no, no kind of precedent. Um, and so um, I guess in academia, um, it, it, it is a challenge um, in interacting with the regulatory process because um, it's, it's quite, there's quite a lot of documentation that needs to be done. And um, obviously we're here, we've got pressures to publish. Uh, and um, so, so that I, I think that engaging with the regulatory process is, is where uh, commercial entities um, add value. Um, but it, it is essential and um, no, no medical device, um, it, I mean, if it is deemed a medical uh, device, it it can't it can't get through it can't it can't get to market if it doesn't pass the the, the relevant regulatory checks. Um, and what about the patent situation? I mean, we uh, uh, Chris uh, uh, gave a, 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 a quite a you know upbeat assessment um, of the possibilities. Do you find that a frustration? Yes and no. I I, I think. I think for any commercial entity, securing IPs is, is essential to, to, to survival. Um, I think investors, it's something that they actively seek. Um, and so there has to be some provision for protecting something, whether it's a barrier to market or, or whatever. But I also see it as um, something that makes the whole process quite inefficient. Um, and what I mean by that is um, generally developing, for example, an implantable medical device will cost something in the region of a hundred, of the order of a hundred million pounds to bring to market. Um, that's the development of the device and all the clinical testing um, up to the point where it, it can be sold as a product. And a lot of that is the documentation and the testing to do with what's required for the regulatory process. So one example is if I want to make an implant and I want to buy a case for an implant and I go to an implant uh, a case manufacturer and I say, I want to buy a case from you. They'll say, uh, detail the specifications of the case. Uh, I might say to them, I just want a standard case, whatever you've developed for somebody else, I'll take the same one and I'll pay whatever you, you, you charge. They'll say to me, that's not possible. They own the IP to everything we've developed for them. So even if they've developed an identical case before, they need to redevelop it for me and to test it in 50 or, 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 50 or 100 of them before they'll deliver one tested product to me. Now, there's a lot of reinvention of the wheel happening because of IP and because a company paid for it, they don't want anyone else to have it. Um, so it might not be patent, but it's, it's still IP. And, and that is, um, it's making developing any devices in this space very expensive um, and there is little reuse. Um, and so I, I, think, I think that's where government can come in and, and kind of, um, help make things more efficient. I, ha I think you have to remember the company you're in, Jim, you know, you've got to keep the lawyers in employment. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you. Um, now, I'm just going to uh, uh, start with David, but I'm going to ask people very quickly before we come on to uh, just a couple of questions, because we're, you know, we're always chasing time this evening. But I'm going to ask you, do you think at this point we should be trying to set red lines at all? Uh, on uh, the kinds of uh, 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 devices that we are developing, or is this, you know, is, would that be grossly premature? But, uh, you know, these red lines, should we sort of say, no, if it's ethically beyond that point, 
is that no uh, is, is that the point of no return uh, uh, but david but you had a you had a point to make anyway Although I was extremely disappointed with the Brexit decision, there is an opportunity. And, I, and one of the things I want to share with Jack is that I think the European Medicines Agency and the other regulations in the EU are too paternalistic. And I think they've actually impeded research. And, they've, and I give you examples, you know, they basically gene transplants for uh, Parkinsonism is effectively stopped because of the requirement by the, the EMA that you have, a, have to have a 25 year follow up, which is, which is kind of insane for something that is as cutting edge as this. So if one of the things we can do breaking out from Europe is to be much, much more uh, agile and sensible. So for instance, those optogenetic, uh, in, well, the genetic transplants that Tim has to do in order to get the optic signal to stop people having uh, epilepsy is probably not possible under current re European regulations. So if we're going to leave Europe, let's change our regulations so we can at least start doing it in humans and let the, let the patient decide. It's not, the regulators have a role to inform patients, but if a patient gives informed consent to being a subject in an experiment like this, let them do it because otherwise, you know, the pro we, we may ne never make progress with these, particularly with these gene uh, implants. Okay, red line. No red line. Red line. No red line. Okay, uh, Brannon. Um, I think a red line that I would be quite came up in the in the question and answer that notion um, is is the is a red line against the black box approach to development of AI. Uh, I think uh, you know the idea that you just let it get on and do its own thing is potentially extremely dangerous. Um, and perhaps uh, one again in the Q and A, somebody asked, uh, "Well, what about um, Asimov's laws of robotics?" And I have to say, I think that's quite a good idea. I'd like to build these four principles into uh, robots if they're going to be allowed to do their own thing. Excellent. No, and 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 many of the codes actually are not dissimilar um, to Asimov's <laughs> laws, basically. Um, Jack. I um, just, just wanted to quickly get on that Brexit point again. I, I think the kind of the implicit unspoken thing when we talk about the fact that the UK is going to make its own regulation, the implicit point of basically saying is that it's going to be some sort of relaxation. That, that's, that's my reading into it. And in order to kind of stimulate the field. So I, I, I think it's entirely possible that there is some sort of relaxation to try and do the kind of things you're mentioning, David. Um, and again, this again ties into the point I'm trying, trying to make about the need to bring the public is that if we are going to do this, then we need to do it with a kind of our own kind of guidance and input from the public on it. Um, with regards to the red lines, um, it's really hard to say, isn't it? I, I, I think one of the points to consider here is that lots of militaries around the world are really interested in this, this kind of technology. And whether or not we say kind of red line in this conversation here is not going to actually impact the kind of research that's going on. Um, in kind of places like DARPA, which are really going to be stressing and kind of testing those limits. Yeah, fair point. Chris. Yeah, thanks. I mean, I'd just like to sound a slight note of caution. I mean, there have been some quite negative stories in the news in the last few years about medical devices that have gone wrong. Um, breast implants, um, vaginal meshes, things like that. And that has been part of the context for the EU um, regulatory drive. So whilst you know, focusing on one narrow area where um, it seems regulation might be holding innovation back, one does have to see the broader context of medical device regulation more broadly and some of the um, poor um, devices that have made it through and caused problems for large numbers of people. Um, anyway, in, in terms of red lines, I mean, I think my thinking would be that what one's got to start drawing lines when um, somebody's behavior or um, actions are potentially being influenced not according to their wishes. Um, and you know, where, it's, where they're being influenced for a therapeutic use, that's one thing, but when one's bleeding away from therapeutic use into uh, recreational use, and that is potentially influencing them uh, that looks like somewhere you should be drawing a line to me. Thank you. And Trish? I think I would want to start before we even define the red line by what it actually means to be a human and for us to have an open and honest discussion about that in society. And I know the Royal Society paper did talk about, do we even know what normality is? 
and uh, I would like us to think about really what is the purpose here? What is the purpose that we're employing these neural brain interfaces and, and computer braces for? And once we understand what the purpose is, then we can think about what ethically is appropriate to align that with our own societal expectations, go to the public, really engage, really ask what, how they want to participate in this discussion and how far is actually then too far to then start drawing the red lines. But we've got to, again, remember when we draw those red lines in regulation, one, they're not completely hard and fast, but they're there for our safeguarding. They're there to protect us. They're there for us to build up trust with the suppliers of these um, uh, technologies in the first place. And for that purpose, we also need a variety of other package of system measures behind the scenes, like governance, to, to really make sure that they not only start trustworthy and ethically aligned, but stay trustworthy and ethically aligned within their purpose limitation that society sets and continues onward to set. It's, it's not a, a static process here. It's that's a very changes. good point because they continuously are developing, uh, especially AI in that context. But that was a very good plug too for Jack's report as well, wasn't it? So all, we're, it, we're all good on that. So um, Tim, I'm just gonna come to you because um, we don't have sadly much time for questions uh, because I want to bring in Jack um, in just a couple of, of minutes. Um, but it, it, this is um, cognate to what we've been talking about as to whether there are red lines. If someone requests a brain interface for gaming, should this be permitted? I mean, these are the sort of dilemmas that people are going to have. You know, say I arrive, I'm a millionaire at your laboratory and say, look, develop me this fantastic new interface that's going to let me live for another 50 years. You know, what, what are the ethics that you see as somebody absolutely front and center in this field? Good question. Um, fortunately or unfortunately, I haven't had that problem. I haven't had anyone coming to me any. <laughs> we, know, <laughs> we, know, we know where you are now. <laughs> um, I, I, I guess what, what I would say is, um, yeah, I, uh, so, so the, I, I think, I think the ethical limits of um, I, 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 think, I think so. Firstly, we, we've got a lot of activity in the non-invasive uh, devices that might be health-related, but they're not designated medical devices. So the, the way the way I see a medical device is if it informs a medical decision, or it's a therapy of some sort. So if it if it by by any way it does something that a medical professional would otherwise do with other means, then we call it a medical device. A Fitbit is looking at my health, but it's not a medical device. Um, the, the Apple Watch is designated a medical device for a specific application um, for, for picking up certain arrhythmias. Um, and so I think outside Outside the space of medical devices, you're right that there is no that there is no um, framework for um, currently for stopping uh, individuals um, claiming certain things. Um, I mean, we're we're seeing lots of companies claiming lots of health-related benefits of devices but no evidence uh, behind it, and there there isn't anybody out there. Kind of regulating these kinds of things. So, um, yeah, I, I think in the commercial consumer space, it's always going to be a problem, and, and we we need to think of um, how we can uh, avoid that. Um, but thank you very much. I just, this all demonstrates to me the fantastic value of interdisciplinary discussion. I think you know we've all learned a huge amount from each other. Um, with, with people that we don't normally converse with in the working day, which I, I think is really, really helpful. Now, um, uh, Jack, in a sense, the dilemmas are not going to go away for the future, are they? And so I'm going to ask you to um, uh, talk to us about um, on the subject of how the next generation neural interfaces will impact the next generation of humans. So uh, these issues are not going to go away. 
Well, thank you, Tim. So I'm going to talk a bit about public engagement. And I've, I've mentioned this many times throughout this kind of discussion we've just been having. Um, but at, at the outset, when Royal Society kind of started our project looking at neural interfaces, the Our Human Report, we really decided to do a bit of kind of practicing what we preached a bit. And we thought we'd run a kind of a series of public dialogue workshops to really think and have a look at what the public do think about this emerging field and where they should see it developing in the future. Um, so yeah, this is a kind of series of dialogue workshops that we commissioned. Um, we ran them across the whole of the UK and from London to Glasgow and Sheffield, with over 200 people being involved in total. Um, and this was really kind of key to help us think about the ethical considerations and recommendations we make in our report. It was a real kind of directly influence to how we thought about this field going forward. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about kind of what the what participants' initial reactions were to the technology before kind of talking about how they think it should develop um, going forward. So this, this kind of photo on the right here, this is a photo of a guy called David Mzi, and he is a man with paraplegia um, who was unable to walk until being um, involved in a trial uh, of a kind of spinal implant that literally has let him walk again. So it, it, it won't come as a surprise to hear that the public fundamentally are amazed about some of these medical advances. We heard earlier from Tim as well um, about the deep brain stimulation and the, the video showing um, how it can stop tremors in Parkinson's. People are amazed by this kind of technology. And one of their kind of first responses is like, great, how do we kind of accelerate this? How do we get this out? How do we, how do we get access to it? And then that quickly moves on to concerns of, uh, we won't, again, they heard this already today. Um, what about equity of access? Who has access to these technologies first? Um, it's a perfectly valid point. Um, so then with regards to non-medical applications, I think, again, kind of following the kind of conversations we've had, people's responses to the non-medical uses are much more, much more varied. Um, and the first thing that people go to really are concerns. And whether this is about kind of data privacy, or this is about kind of, um, Tim, I think you mentioned a lot about addiction and addiction and people's use of their phones. So people are very concerned about whether people simply will stop interacting socially. Um, if we have a kind of more direct uh, connection with our technology. And much more broadly, where, where the, is the use of these technologies going to take society? Um, now the really interesting thing to consider about these dialogue workshops that we run is, is, is that we had, the way we designed them is we had one workshop that was kind of um, educating people and giving people opportunity to learn about the field. And then we had a two week break. In that two week break, we really encouraged participants to speak to their family and friends and really kind of sort of uh, digest a bit about what they'd learn. And the really interesting thing we saw in this kind of two week break, so when they came back, people's reactions to how these technologies should be used um, really evolved and changed over the course of the workshops, and particularly with regards to non-medical uses. Um, so one of the things people noticed, and you can see the photo just down there, is that this is a kind of, um, this is some technology that's, that's been used in academia. And one of the things that people noticed is when, when they saw kind of um, some of the non-medical uses, things like uh, kernel, they were like, oh, these things are really glossy. These things are kind of aesthetically pleasing. These things look like they're designed to be used. And quite rightly, people wondered whether these real kind of investment in the non-medical uses of these technologies could benefit the medical sector as well. Just again, perfect good point. Um, and finally, people got kind of excited about the, the possibility of new forms of communication and also new, new means of creativity, which uh, sadly us as the Royal Society being a scientific body <laughs> hadn't quite considered, but it's, again, it's a really interesting take on where, what these technologies might let us do in the future. Um, so we did, obviously we did more than just simply getting their initial views on things. We wanted to really engage the public and think about how these technologies should, should be developed and what some kind of ethical considerations are. So again, data privacy is something that's come up over and over again. People are really concerned that um, neurotechnologies engage with their nervous system. And this is gonna create data that's much more personal than simply using social media or Facebook or, or simply using their smartphone. So what's happening to this data? Who is using it? There was a real desire for transparency going forward. Um, and one of the points that people kept on making is, is the real need for ongoing public engagement. And uh, people really enjoyed being part of this process. It's a really early stage technology and people want to have a say about how this should develop. And they really kind of, it really kind of, honed in on the benefits of doing so. And finally, there was a real call for ethical frameworks to guide the development going forward. Um, I don't know how much you can see of this kind of photo I've got on the right here, but this is, this is a kind of um, a roadmap that some participants developed in one of the sessions. It's, 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 it's kind of amazing. It's basically doing my job for me, essentially. On, on the right here, there's a kind of this amazing roadmap that goes from creating a code of ethics 
um, to regulation to an independent certified body with um, lots of experts involved and then going around to more public engagement in iterative process. It's amazing. <laughs> People are actually really good at considering this kind of thing. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about other things that could influence public perception of this field going forward. I think we've had a kind of a lot of talk of Neuralink and we ran these workshops before Neuralink had demoed an implant in a pig, which they did earlier on this year. And I, I know simply anecdotally from speaking to people, friends even about my work that now everyone goes, oh, right, oh, the Elon Musk thing with a pig, right? So th this, is, this is kind of a good example of how um, kind of new new businesses and consumer consumer um, facing products can really kind of help define the narrative um, of what people think about these technologies. Um, and David Nutt was also speaking a lot about kind of um, COVID and uh, anti-vax. And I think there's, there's there's something really to be learned from about these um, about the kind of I think anti-vax, but also I think if you think about five G. Um, we've seen examples of people attacking 5G towers from being concerned about um, the impact these may have on their health or and about issues about control as well. Now, I think if, if, if people can have concerns uh, like this about 5G, I think we really need to be careful with neurotechnologies, things that directly um, interact with your brain clearly have much more potential um, to be perceived as something that's, that's a real kind of threat, right? And finally, other things that can influence public, um, public perception of these technologies is, is simply new policy. Um, there's, there's kind of some interest in the UK developing a new neurotechnology strategy um, and looking at kind of uh, becoming really de developing and building our strength in this area. And, and public, the public pick up on this, and this is something that, that could also kind of impact public perception. Um, so I'm not going to spend too much longer on this slide. This is kind of just highlighting everything I've said already. But the main thing I want to kind of really point here is that, again, to hammer down the point that this, this public public dialogue exercise was actually really useful for us to kind of really feed in and, and develop our own recommendations. And you can see at several points, this has become a key point of what we said about this field going forward, um, from calling for a new democratized anticipatory approach to also um, bringing the general public to be given a clear voice in shaping the future of neural interface regulation. Um, so I think I'm going to leave it at that. And if we do have any time, I'm very happy to answer any questions. We'd love to ask you questions, Jack, but sadly, uh, we're running out of time. But, um, but we're just disappointed that we didn't see the real Gertrude. I know, I'm so sorry. <laughs> but I, I, I assume that Gertrude is still under wraps in California or somewhere. Uh, there's, there's a video of Gertrude, actually. <laughs> you can find it. Um, I was a bit reluctant to grab a, grab a photo of being concerned about copyright. <laughs> Very, very responsible of you, exactly. uh, but you'd have been well defended by uh, by <laughs> yeah. Bird and Bird. Chris, Chris would have been only too happy to act for you. Um, well, look, um, it only remains for me before I hand back to uh, Trish and Bill um, to thank the panel very much indeed. We've had a great conversation. I would not have the temerity to sum up uh, the proceedings, but I think there's an awful lot of food for thought. Um, uh, you know, about the uh, level of uh, governance versus regulation, the, the technologies that we need to think about going forward, uh, the difference between a medical device and a wearable, um, you know, the power of the big tech companies and so on. Um, and indeed, um, not that I would ever want to dispute with Rannan the kind of ethical framework that we actually uh, need to have going forward. You know, what is it practicable um, and, you know, I asked the question slightly uh, with some levity earlier about a Hippocratic Oath, but, um, you know, our medics have that. So why not, why not our app developers, so to speak, and our medical device developers? So, you know, there are ideas out there which, which can, be, uh, can be taken forward. And a lot of the points, you know, that Jack makes in uh, iHuman, I think, are really and the Royal Society make an eye human are things we should be taking forward. I mean, an industrial strategy for a start um, for neurotechnology seems to be a pretty good place. If we can do it for AI, um, we should be doing it for neurotechnology, which has many of the same ethical issues, the black box issues, the explainability aspect, the autonomy aspects. Um, so I'm sure that is something which policymakers need to be looking at. So. Thank you very much indeed um, to everybody attending as well. And back to Bill and Trish. Okay, thank, thank you, Tim. And I would just like to, uh, on behalf of Friends of Imperial College, uh, 
Yeah, thank uh, Lord Tim Clement Jones and the other participants, uh, and also the audience. So this this event was a bit of a leap into the unknown. Uh, yeah, you know, challenge to put on a a complex topic, a panel discussion, and glad to see we've uh, we've retained an audience of about eighty people uh, up to this uh, late late period in the evening. So with with that, uh, thanks to everybody, and a quick hand over to Trish. I just want to thank everyone also who bared with us tonight. This is a truly socially distant event. We have been COVID compliant and um, I hope it has given everyone a uh, significant food for thought, not least uh, thanks to our friends of Imperial College, but also to the Society for Computers and Law members and uh, other uh, non-members who have joined us kindly tonight. Um, really just want to say that our hope is that as a group that this conversation doesn't finish here, that this continues, that this interdisciplinarity between the various professions actually continues, that we, we learn from one another to, to gauge a better picture of what that industrial strategy for neurotechnology might look like. So um, we hope to be um, advancing on from this conversation into some kind of working group. We'll, we'll find out more about that and inform everyone who's participated tonight um, more about that once um, we've finalised the details of it. But yeah, our hope is that we would we'd come out with some more concrete proposals, recommendations and policy ways to move forward. So thank you very much, everyone, for bearing with us. Thank you for enjoying tonight. And thank you to all our panellists. A little virtual round of applause for everyone. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you again to Lord Tim Clements jones for chairing all the way through tonight and, and keeping us to time-ish. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you very much. Good night, everyone. Bye-bye.